And now I would like to welcome uh, Bjorte Boxman, oh, sorry, Boxness. <laughs> welcome to Belgrade. Thank you. Bjorte, you are going to talk to us today about uh, a concept or an approach which might be involving some debunking of myths and approaches. Absolutely. Can you elaborate or you prefer to elaborate a bit later? I will do that in my session. Okay, do you expect to get into any fight later over uh, your concept or just a polite discussion? Well, I will try to provoke you a bit. Huh? I'll see if I succeed. Yeah, I'll do good. my best. <laughs> yeah. have, you, have you been before to Belgrade? Actually, I have uh, twice. Last time was uh, another Agile conference I spoke at. And the first time was actually back in 1976. I was on Interrail. I was 18 years old. And that was an interesting experience. Oh, yes. you are aware that 1976 was still Tito time? Yes. It was, okay. and I was there. You're aware that 80% of the, 100% of the audience was still, you know, not even in the minds of their mothers and fathers? I'm painfully aware of that, yes. <laughs> so now we are talking life <laughs> experience and expertise. So, um, Bjarte, is there anything specific that we should know about you? Is there any type of music that you really like and any hobby that is related to it? Well, I've been into uh, music, rock music, I mean, since back in 1976 and much before that. And I collect vinyl records. You know, the CD and uh, downloads, I mean, cannot compare to the great sound of a vinyl record. So I'm going to go hunting for some vinyl record shops in, in Belgrade. Oh, amazing. So if any people in the audience, if any participants know. know, like the tips and tricks where to get good vinyl yes. records, like the records for gramophone, is yeah. how we call it in, in our language, they should come to you. Yes, please. Okay. And, uh, ah, so you have a collection of records. I do have a collection of records. At your home in Norway? Yes. But you travel a lot, you never get to listen to them? No. But so, so you <laughs> Not are, enough. You Not are enough. a hoarder of records. <laughs> okay, well, just so we keep the, the good practice that we started today, uh, Bjorte is offering free drinks tonight, at least two, and he's Norwegian. I understand that Norwegian have capacity. This could be prejudiced, so... But anyways, two drinks tonight from uh, from Bjorte, who can, for the person who can guess how many vinyl records, long play records, does Bjorte have in his home collection? So, you know, calculate the age, 1976, you know, that sort of stuff, so multiply, whatever. So, we are open to get, uh, to get, the, to get your numbers, the best guesser, or the correct guesser, guess the drinks from Bjorke, from Bjorte in, in Reka. Do also make sure to ask the questions uh, to Bjorte and then he will be uh, addressing them in the last 10 minutes or so of the presentation and throughout the day. Please enjoy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I hope you do that when I'm finished as well. Applaud. Um, as you can read from my title, I'm, part of my session today is about Agile and what I'm going to say about Agile is no criticism even if you, some of you might perceive it like that. But I've been a big fan of Agile for many, many years, even before the Agile Manifesto was uh, developed. And um, if you look at the Agile Alliance website, uh, somewhere it says that the first international Agile conference was organized on the island of Sardinia um, in year 2000, called XP2000. And I was there sharing Beyond Budgeting, speaking about Beyond Budgeting to a great group of people in the Agile community who are still my friends. So, uh, but the topic is um, an introduction to Beyond Budgeting and also the elephant in the room when it comes to um, Agile transformation. Whenever I talk about Beyond Budgeting, and I know you might be a bit confused about what it is, but I will get to it, but there is one word that keeps coming up over and over again, and that is the word control. And the context is, of course, the fear of losing control. That is why this word is coming up from executives, from finance people, from managers. 
And then I often ask them, okay, but what do you mean with control? Can you please exp explain, define it for me? And after people have said cost control, many go quiet. They actually struggle with putting words on what they are so afraid of losing, which is interesting. So I checked up in Oxford Dictionary, how do they define control? And as you can see, they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what does this mean in organizational terms, in business terms? Well, it basically means two things, controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two main assumptions behind traditional management, including budgeting. Number one, you can't trust people. Number two, the future is predictable and planable. And you know, and I know, that this is not true. So this is what we are challenging in Beyond Budgeting, because this is nothing but illusions of control. Well, of course you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, they hopefully find a way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. Talking about trusting uh, people, I've always traveled a lot, and I'm sure many of you do it as well, and the first thing I always check coming into the hotel room at night is what kind of clothing hangers do they have? Is it the one at the top with a hook, or is it that stupid one at the bottom, which is a hassle to use? All right? So how come some hotels offer us those stupid hangers at the bottom? Yes, I think we know why, because it's about a few stolen hangers, right? And what was the response? To punish everybody because somebody did something wrong. Actually, one of the problems with traditional management, which I will come back to. Wise people out there has very much agreed with what I just have said. Uh, good old Peter Drucker. Um, most of what you call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And I couldn't agree more, because sometimes the problem is that we manage too much. And when it comes to predicting the future, then planning, corporate planning, another wise person, his name was Russell Aikoff, he compared a lot of the corporate planning he observed in large organizations, he compared it with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I can relate to what he's saying here, this guy is saying as well, because I have done a lot of dancing in my life. My first management job after graduating from business studies um, many years ago in um, uh, what is uh, one of Scandinavia's largest companies called Equinor, used to be called Statoil, um, was head of the corporate budget department. So I've been heading up more budget processes in my life than I want to be reminded about. But it also means that I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that a hundred years ago invented a fantastic machine. It was state of the art and key for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble, didn't work that well, and today this machine is completely broken. It looked like this. This is not a true story. Because in real life, hopefully, people would have done something 50 years ago, right? Either try to fix this machine, or even better, try to invent a new machine, because innovation is something we all love, right? Innovation is great. We all want to be leading edge, unique, right on the forefront, better than everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation, that seems to be limited to technology innovation, into products and services and, and, and so on. But there is also something called management innovation that we shall talk about today. Exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that isn't great. That is scary, right? And the consequence of this is that it is very crowded on the left. And by the way, why is management innovation scary? Why right? kicking out the budget? Are you crazy? Right? So the consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side because everybody is into that innovation in some form or shape. Management innovation is not yet a crowded place because, again, it feels scary. But both of these um, innovation types have the same purpose. It is about getting better performance, and you can get just as much performance out of 
and competitive advantage out of being good on management innovation as on technology innovation. There are companies out there, and I have an example for you a bit later, who openly say that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce, what we sell, what we provide. We find it in the way we lead and manage. So, um, I will com come back to that important word, performance. That is why we should go beyond budgeting, because it is good for performance defined the right way. But, again, still called beyond budgeting, has something to do with budgets and budget solving budget problems. And by the way, when I say budget here, you need to think about budgets in a broader context than what maybe you typically think about as kind of cost budgets, project budgets. I mean, in the finest definition is broader. We are talking about profit and loss budgets, um, cash flow budgets, and so on. So think about it a little bit broader. Uh, and I want to share with, with you my budget problem list, which is quite long. Uh, very time-consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets. Assumptions quickly outdated. Good luck, good luck to any company that has no finished their budget for 2024. I mean, then they know something about next year that I don't know. Uh, this is a serious problem. Budgeting can stimulate what I would call unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the um, resource hoarding, that is not the kind of behavior we would like to see between um, colleagues. That's a serious problem. At the same time, I'm not blaming anyone for behaving like this, because they are just responding to the system we have designed for them to operate within. So if we want to change behaviors, it's not about changing or fixing people, it's about fixing systems, which again will change behaviors. Budgets can create illusions of control, as we touched upon. And, of course, it might feel very comfortable to have next year described with a million details and decimals, but again, the only thing we know is that we don't know, and that we are wrong. Budgets can force us to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn, the year before, what we shall do next year, right, and what it shall cost. And in big organizations, very often, too many of these decisions are taken too high up. That doesn't always improve the quality of decisions. Very often it is the other way around. Budget can prevent us, or budgets can prevent us from doing things that we should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget, right? And sometimes this might also work the other way around. Could it sometimes lead us to do things that we shouldn't have done, but it is in the budget and it is spend it or lose it? You know what happens if you don't use your budget. And linked to this, I fully accept that the cost budget can be a very effective ceiling on, on, on cost. It typically works, but that is just half the story, because that ceiling is just as effective as the floor, in the sense that the, these budgets tend to be spent. And to define good performance as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow and uh, mechanical and very often a completely irrelevant way of defining good performance. I mean, is it good performance to hit your cost budget if you should have spent more or could have spent less, as one example? And one more problem, which um, uh, actually too many haven't thought about. I've call, called it conflicting purposes. I'll come back to that problem. It's an interesting problem because it's both a problem but represents solutions to many of these other issues. I've been sharing this list of, prob of problems with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the almost 30 years I've been working with Beyond Budgeting. And most people out there agree. Executives, managers, finance people, a lot of nodding heads and guilty smiles when these, this list is coming up. At the same time, most organizations still continue doing this stuff that they do admit isn't very smart, even if that is changing these days. And I have a theory about why. Um, it could be that these problems are kind of recognized, um, but they are more regarded like irritating itches and not symptoms of a bigger and deeper uh, problem. But that is exactly what these problems are, symptoms of a huge problem, which is also a paradox. And that huge problem is that here we are looking at the process that was um, invented. By the way, do you know how, how old Beyond Budgeting is as, as a management technology? 30 years. 30 years. 100 years old. There was a book coming out 101 years ago called Budgetary Control. Do you know who wrote that book? His name was James O. McKinsey. 
the founder of McKinsey Consulting. I never met Mr. McKinsey, but I actually don't think he was an evil man. Right? I actually think he had the best of intentions to help organizations perform better. This was management innovation 100 years ago. And I'm sure it worked reasonably well 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago. But today, this way of thinking, this way of managing is doing exactly the opposite. It has become more of a barrier than a support for getting out the best possible performance in organizations. And that, my friends, I would call a pretty big problem. So we are back to this important word, performance. And I'd like to reflect on that word now for a few minutes in a very different setting than organizations and business and, uh, and, and, and that kind of performance. I would like us to move into traffic. Because when we are out driving, we would also like to experience good performance. And for me, that would be a safe and good flow. I simply hate traffic jams. And I've never understood why it's called the rush hour or rush traffic. There's no rush at all. Those cars are standing dead still, but um, there's so much that I don't understand. Anyway, I think traffic authorities want the same, and this is something we often meet when there is crossing traffic. And this light has no sensors, okay? And to these questions, the one who is control in control here, who makes decisions about when you can drive, when you have to stop, that is the person that programmed this light. Right? That's the manager here. And where would that person be as you sit there waiting for the green light? Well, somewhere else. I never checked, but I don't think there was anybody sitting inside that pool. And which information would this programming be based on? It would be based on some historical trends, right? Some, um, maybe some forecast, but not entirely fresh information as you sit there waiting. So here we have a management model where the manager is absent and decisions are made based on somewhat outdated information. Fortunately, there is uh, another solution, very different solution, with exactly the same purpose. We are talking about the wrong debate. Same questions, very different answers. Because here, we make decisions as drivers about when to drive and when to stop. And the information we apply to make these decisions is, of course, fresh, real-time information. So very different answers. It could be interesting to compare uh, these two ways of um, managing. And here I've got a few leading questions for you. Um, it's actually proven scientifically that the roundabout is not just more efficient, it's also um, safer, and lifetime cycle cost is lower. At the same time, we also know that it takes more competence from us to relate to and drive in a roundabout. It is much easier with that traffic light. And as you all know, Going back to our organizations, everything we need to leave behind of traditional management is in many ways so much easier for everybody involved, executives, managers, finance people, compared to what we need to move towards instead. So uh, going beyond budgeting is not easier, but it is so much better and trust me, so much more fun. But it's not enough with having access to fresh information and the authority to, to uh, respond on that we also need a positive value set. If there is a value set among drivers, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest, that is normally not a big problem in front of that light, hopefully overruled by, by red. But in the roundabout, me first, don't care about the rest, can be a big problem. Because here, we are much more dependent on everybody involved sharing this positive wish or or yeah, of, of desire of wanting this to flow well. Here, we have to help each other. We have to interact with each other in a very different way than what we need to do in front of that light. Two other important words here. Trust is obviously one. In front of that light, we are not trusted. In the roundabout, we are trusted. Transparency is also an important word. Not that important in front of the light. As long as you can see the color, you can make your decision. In the roundabout, you need to see and understand the entire situation before you make your decision. The roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And self-regulation is another important word in beyond budgeting. And I'm getting closer to define or share with you what that stuff is. Um, and organizations today need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. The first reason our business environment, 
the uh, VUCA level out there. I mean, I guess all speakers today are talking about VUCA. And if we take that VUCA level seriously, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity, it must have implications for how we design our management models compared to if there is little or no VUCA out there. That should be quite obvious. But there is one more reality that we need to reflect on. That's not external, it's internal, it has to do with people. Asking ourselves, what kind of people do we generally think that we have in the organization? And I guess most of you are familiar with Douglas McGregor's Theory X and Theory Y. These two opposing views on people and what motivates people. Where um, Theory X is this negative view that well, most people, most employees, that's a bunch of pot potential thieves and crooks. And unless we manage them tightly, they will all run away and do a lot of stupid things and spend money like drunken sailors. Well, McGregor, in his book back then in 1960, he was a bit more polite than academic, but I think that what he, that's what he meant. Then you have theory Y, a much more positive view on people, a view that actually most employees, they want to perform, right? They want to do their best. They want to be involved. They want to be listened to. They want to be treated as adults. And we don't need to agree so far on where our sympathy lies, X or Y, even if I have a certain hope. But it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in theory X, our management model should look very different compared to if we mainly believe in theory Y. And if we then combine the two, it could look like this, and you recognize the two dimensions. And traditional management lies in that lower left-hand corner with a conscious or unconscious assumption that um, the future is still predictable and planable and that most people is on the X side. If we disagree with that, then this, is, then this is not the place to be. Then we need to move up in that upper right hand corner by addressing both leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of, I have used the following words to, um, uh, to describe traditional management. And some people have told me that, Bjarte, you're a bit hard on traditional management here. But again, I've been sharing this, these words, this slide, with so many people all over the world. And a lot of the looks I get when these words are coming up is, I can only interpret those looks in one way. So what? Isn't this the way it has to be? Well, maybe there was a time when this was the right thing to do. But as we just talked about, things have changed. So, what do we need to do? And we are still a little bit on a kind of headline level, but on the leadership side, we need to be more purpose-based, more values-based, and less rules-based. We are not saying no rules, we are saying less and more. There has to be more autonomy. In this VUCA world, there isn't always time to run nine floors off to get that decision. And with these people on board, very often they can make great decisions for themselves. Transparency. Here comes that important word again. And in this context, this is good news for scared executives, scared, scared managers, scared finance people, afraid of leaving that rather comfortable corner down um, in the lower left-hand corner, because again, they are afraid of losing control. And the good news is that transparency can actually be a very effective control mechanism, a social control mechanism. And let me tell you a little story. Um, you might have heard about the Swiss pharmaceutical giant called Roche, who today are on a beyond budgeting journey, by the way. They did a very interesting experiment some years ago. In a pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, they kicked out travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So with a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. If you travel to where, did you fly, sleep, eat, cheaper, expensive? open for your colleagues to see, and vice versa. And guess what happened with travel cost in that pilot? Came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism. This was about tearing all pages in that rules book instead of doing the opposite. But, there is a but here. It's a very powerful mechanism. It has to be applied with wisdom. So if it becomes naming and shaming, it doesn't work. That is why we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a controlled perspective. Because how can we learn from each other if everything is secret? And last but not least, internal or intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic, external motivation. And as you, as you know, the most common way to motivate people um, 
uh, extrinsically uh, in, in business today is individual bonus. And I can think of no area where there's a bigger gap between what most research is telling us and about what most businesses are practicing. Because what, what this research is telling us is that individual bonus can be very effective if three conditions are in place. If there's little motivation in the job itself, if it's easy to count and measure, and if quantity is more important than quality. So for picking fruit, chasing rats, maybe, maybe some simple sales work, it works. But says research, moving into knowledge work in knowledge organizations, other things like mastery, autonomy, purpose, belonging, is much more powerful when it comes to helping people motivate themselves. Anyway, a number of organizations, they, if you look at what they write about people, say about people and employees, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice words, but it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership intentions if you have theory X management processes. And that is the case in so many organizations. So if we are serious about these words, we have to change our management processes to reflect these words while also at the same time making our management processes more VUCA robust. And if you headlines of what that can mean in practice, uh, the traditional detailed annual budget typically has to go because it represents so much of what you find in that lower left hand corner. More specifically, when we shall set targets and goals, to the extent we shall do that, many of the beyond budgeting companies do not have targets, but that's a different story. But if we have targets, could we learn something from football? I have yet to meet a football team saying that the ambition for next season, well, that is to score 49 goals and get uh, 45 points. They don't think like that. Those are budget goals, and instead, these teams, they think in terms of doing well against peers, right? The other teams, and hopefully better than everybody else. And that relative thinking can actually also be applied in, in business sometimes. When it comes to the rhythm of these processes, why on earth shall everything circulate around the fiscal year of typically January to December? From a pure business point of view, that cycle is very often a completely artificial construct. So where is possible, where it makes sense, we need management processes which are more business driven, more event driven and less calendar driven. And last but not least, we cannot reduce performance evaluation to compare two numbers, budget versus actual, and then conclude. We need a richer, broader, more intelligent performance evaluation. And this, my friends, was a very high-level introduction to what Beyond Bergen is about, addressing both leadership and management processes in a coherent, consistent way in order to become more adaptive and more human. It is as simple and as difficult as that. So that is the kind of the high-level introduction. The model itself, with its 12 principles, look like this. Um, I will not go through this in detail uh, on this slide. I will come back to some of this uh, afterwards. But again, you can see that we are addressing both leadership principles and management processes. With a very strong focus on creating a coherence between what we say on the left-hand side and what we do on the right-hand side. And a classical example of the opposite that you find in so many organizations. It doesn't help that we on the left-hand side, principle four, autonomy, talks loud and warm about how fantastic employees we have on board, and we would be nothing without you, and we trust you so much. But not that much. Of course we need detailed travel budgets, are you crazy? This is hypocrisy. And people notice and the words on the left become, become hollow because what, what we do on the right hand side speak 10 times louder than what we say on the left hand side. These are principles. This is not the recipe, right? So what this should mean in, in an organization, that depends on that organization's business, culture, history, and that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you have to do is to buy the books, hire the consultants, tick the boxes. I find that both boring and dangerous. And coming now into Agile here, I do see some uh, examples in Agile of what I would call recipes. And again, be careful. I hope you see that there are some similarities here with the Agile Manifesto. This stuff was actually form formulated three years earlier, back in 1998. Um, and again, I'm a big fan of Agile, uh, but 
the reason for my title, Agile Transformation and the Elephant in the Room, is that everybody wants to scale Agile for good reasons, and everybody wants Agile transformations in the full organization. I think there are three reasons why that is difficult and why so many fail. Um, first of all, I think, and again, this is not criticism, it's just observations. One, some of the reasons for the initial su success of Agile in those early pioneer years in big companies, I think has to do with this birthplace in software development and how teams work. Because what do you think executives upstairs observed in those pioneer years? They observed better projects, better outcomes, more engaged employees. Who can be against that? Hey guys, I love Agile, keep up the good work. Then Agile started to scale and then suddenly for these ex executives, it wasn't that fun anymore, but because now it had implications for their behaviors and attitudes and, 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 and so on. That's one reason why scaling is difficult. Beyond budgeting has gone for the throat of these executive beliefs from day one, because we were born as a business agility enterprise uh, uh, model. Uh, the other thing is that when scaling Agile, I think we need to be a bit careful with applying exactly the same langui label, languages, that again, still make sense in that uh, birthplace area. You know, for an executive in a big company who don't play, is not familiar with Agile, don't play rugby, they might think that Scrum is some kind of skin disease, or that Sprint is about running faster, or uh, Slack is about laziness, or that continuous delivery is about 24-7. Right, so we need a language here that these guys can relate to, and they understand what we talk about in Beyond Budgeting. They might disagree with us in some areas, but they do understand what we talk about. The last reason why scaling Agile is difficult is that, again, uh, Agile was not developed as a way to run an enterprise in an Agile way. So when you scale it, the holes in Agile become visible. So if you look at the right-hand side, the management processes, um, you don't find much in the manifesto about target setting, forecasting, resource allocation, performance evaluation, rewards, and so on, right? But ask any executive, they want to know, well, how will this work in the new world, in a new model, and we have the answers. Today, a number of companies are on this journey in some form or shape, and I could have talked for hours and hours and hours about amazing cases here, we don't have the time. So just quickly, two examples. Let's start in Norway. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, there is a company called Miles. Miles is a Norwegian IT company, no budgets, no targets. So if you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as expensive as you want, replace it as often as you want. No PC budgets. You can attain whatever conference course and course you want, as often as you want, wherever in the world. No travel budgets, no training budgets. But it's not an anarchy. When you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that training, you need to post on the internet what you did and the cost of it. So transparency is their control mechanism, and they have no problems whatsoever with cost, and the company is doing great, by the way. But the, one of the pioneers in the Beyond Budgeting movement is a bank, a very, very old bank, founded back in 1870. And in 1970, this bank completely transformed itself before there was, called, and there was nothing called Agile Transformation at the time. And I'm talking about the bank at the top here, Handelsbanken, um, quite big in Northern Europe, 700 branches, quite big in the UK, by the way. And the guy who got it all started um, back then uh, was Mr. Jan Valander. He's passed away now. Um, and this is something about he said about the budget, which I find quite interesting. Uh, again, very fascinating bank. No budgets, no targets, no individual bonus. Well, that's interesting, but it doesn't stop here. They have been doing this since 1970. And it doesn't stop here either, because this bank has been, been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. It's a bank with a lot of autonomy, a lot of transparency, very simple management processes, a very strong and positive belief in people, very low turnover. Um, they hardly fire people, have a very long-term view on, on uh, employment. Um, really, really an uh, exciting, uh, exciting uh, bank. Um, and what they do is 
they think very much in terms of football and league tables. So every month, every branch can see how am I doing on a little handful of selected metrics, KPIs. One of them is called cost-income ratio as a percentage, right? And if you're a branch doing kind of worse than others on cost-income ratio, there are no instructions from above saying that now you have to cut cost or do this or do that. So the message from above is that, okay, we note that you have a problem, but it's your problem, you are closest to that problem, you know best what the right medicine is, and your medicine cupboard contains most of what is needed to do something about it. Is this is about hiring more people, local decision? Right? Is this is about doing this, doing that, local decision? No targets coming from above that, well, uh, now you're at the bottom of that table and next year you should kind of move two places. Uh, the branch itself might say that, yes, we want to, we want to um, uh, climb to or <laughs> climb on the table, but there's a big difference between targets that you set for yourself versus targets that are set on you. So, this bank was about business agility before that term was born. And um, uh, many, many years later, two English researchers discovered that bank, um, some other companies, uh, one of which I worked for at the time, um, and they saw that something was happening here. Uh, people doing interesting things with budgets and a lot of other things. They saw a number of similarities between what these companies did and also and what they rebelled against. And that was kind of that research work resulted then in these 12 beyond budgeting uh, principles. Now, some people say that, well, this is all nice and, and, and uh, beautiful and so on, but this is so big and so scary. A lot of finance people would say that. Um, and I don't think you guys will be scared by, by uh, looking at uh, those uh, principles, but uh, trust me, a lot of executives and finance people would be. So, for those guys, we have a very simple, practical, tested way of getting started. And I know now we are moving into pure finance territory. For those of you who are very far from that function, might struggle a bit, but uh, I think it's important that you understand what I'm talking about, because these are arguments you can bring back to your finance people afterwards, and they will probably get it. It is about asking a very simple question. Namely, why do we budget? What's the purpose of a budget? And again, I'm talking about a broader definition than just the project and cost budgets. And most people would come up with three different reasons why companies make budgets. The first reason has to do with target setting. Companies set target, make budgets to set targets. Financial targets, sales targets, production targets. So that's one purpose. The other reason is that companies want to use these budgets to try to understand what next year could look like in terms of profit, cash flow, and so on. So it is a kind of forecast of what next year can look like, a forecast. So then we've got two purposes, target, forecast. The third purpose of a budget is resource allocation, handing out back some money to the organization on operating costs and on investments projects. And it might seem very efficient to solve all three in one process and one set of numbers. But this is a problem because, I mean, if you haven't experienced this, let me explain what happens when companies try to do this in one process and one set of numbers. Let's assume that the company, um, uh, they want to understand next year's profit. So uh, finance upstairs, they ask people responsible for the sales side. Um, what are your best numbers for next year? But all of these guys know that what I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a target for next year, maybe with a bonus attached to it. And trust me, that insight, that might do something to the level of numbers submitted, and it will go this way. Everybody wants to reach the target, so get them as low as possible. Uh, moving to the cost side, um, then the same people, other people are asked, what are your best numbers for next year? But everybody knows that this is my only chance of getting access to resources for next year. And some might also recall that 20% cut from last year. And trust me, 
that insight and that memory might also do something to the level of numbers submitted. And this is a problem because it destroys uh, not just the quality of numbers, but also it stimulates this behavior we talked about, which is how this borderline unethical, even if I'm not blaming these guys. So that's the bad news. The good news is that there, it's a very simple solution. We recommend that we can still do these three things, but we have to do them in three different processes because these are different things, right? A target is an aspiration. It's what we want to happen. While a forecast is an expectation. It's about what we think will happen, whether we like what we see or not. Brutally honest, the expected outcome, 50-50. And resource allocation, that is about optimizing what is often scarce resources, namely, um, uh, when I say resources, I'm more on the money side than on the people side, but of course, yeah. Uh, and when we have separated, then we can, first of all, we can allow for a target to be more ambitious than the forecast, which is typically should be, but more importantly, when we have separated, that opens up for an improvement agenda. Then we can start to improve each of these one by one in ways impossible when it was all bundled in one process and one set of numbers on the left hand side. So now we can have great discussions about how can we set better targets that really motivates people and inspire and stretch people without feeling stretched. And here thinking football and relative goals can sometimes be a solution. Uh, how can we get the politics out of the forecasting so that we know we can trust the numbers? And one way of getting the politics out is to say that this is just the forecast. That forecast number is not a bid into a target negotiation. It's not an application for resources. We have different processes for that. And we don't need a million details here. I mean, in a forecast, we are looking at the future. The future carry uncertainty. The further ahead we look, the more uncertainty there is. That is very different from turning around and looking at Looking back at history through accounting, we had decimals and details, um, not only, only uh, I mean, might make, make more sense, but it's often required. But we can't bring the accounting mindset of precision and details with us when we turn around and look at the future. For some finance people, that is painful, but um, that's part of the game. And last but not least, um, how can we find more intelligent, effective ways of managing costs than what Mr. McKinsey could offer us a hundred years ago. And last but not least, how can we organize each of these processes on a rhythm that better reflects not just the kind of business we're in, but also the each purpose? Of course, we wouldn't change targets as often as we change forecasts and resource allocation, as I will come back to, we would do that almost all the time. This is an important slide, uh, again, for, for um, for many reasons. First of all, I mean, it is a way to get started on a beyond budgeting journey because when you have moved into those improvement discussions, you are, you will at some point kind of come into those bigger discussions. Target setting, what really motivates people? Resource allocation, do we need detailed travel budgets if we say we trust people? And so on and so on. So it is a great, um, simple way to get started. And of the companies you saw on that list, I think I've helped around 40 of them to get started over the years. And this is where we started with most of them. The other beauty of this is that when people say that it's impossible to operate without a budget, then our response is this slide, this picture, this illustration. Because here the message is that we still do what that budget tried to do for us, but because we've separated, we can do each one in so much, much better uh, ways. I could have talked for hours and hours about how to improve all of these three, but most questions seem to be on the, uh, or typically comes on the last point, how to manage cost without a budget. So I'm going to spend my last slides on that topic, and then we have to leave the few other ones for another uh, occasion. And when it comes to uh, managing cost without a budget, independent of what kind of alternative tools, processes we use, there has to be something um, a platform um, that, that needs to be in place or to be built, which is about building what we call a cost-conscious mindset. 
And that involves very much asking different questions than what you hear in a budget process. Because in a budget process, uh, or in the budget world, then um, when you make a decision that costs money, then the question is, well, do I have a budget for this? And uh, if you have, it's okay. If you don't have, it's not okay. A little bit simplified. We would like to hear more of these questions on the right-hand side. Is this really necessary? What is good enough? How is this creating value? And is this within my execution framework? This is not an anarchy, right? This is not an anarchy. It is about, um, uh, we are trying to make the room to move in bigger, but there are still walls in that room, as we will come back to. That mindset is for some companies enough, combined with some transparency, um, like Miles. Um, the companies I've worked for, including, uh, again, um, uh, this large uh, uh, Norwegian company, um, need something more. And the more typically falls into two categories. The first category is projects, investments. And for that company, which is in the energy business, uh, that is, of course, more about projects with a lot of steel and, 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 and concrete than software projects. Uh, but the thinking is very much the same. Um, that company invests between 10 and, we're talking about Equinor, uh, invests between 10 and 15 billion US dollars a year. The company has no traditional investment budget where they sit in the autumn the year before <coughs> and decide exactly how much to invest, exactly split on these projects, and then this is handed out as next year project money for each project. Instead, there is a, pro a process inspired by a very simple saying, the bank is always open. The line can always forward a project for approval at any time, at any time. Whether you get a yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project against the criteria the company has? Financial, non-financial, strategic, sustainability criteria. Second question, can we afford it as things look today? So a very, I mean, this is, this is beyond budget's version of continuous delivery. Not of software uh, uh, functionality, but of money and, and resources. Uh, when we move to operating costs, it's, it's a little bit more challenging, but we have a solution for that as well. We have a menu, and on that menu, what we want to leave behind is what you see on the left-hand side, right? that detailed traditional annual cost budget. We want something with more autonomy, more flexibility. Here is one alternative, a burn rate guiding. There is a number still in the range of 1,000, 1 million, 10, 100, within that full autonomy. But we can go even further, make it even more self-regulating by moving from thinking in absolute terms to thinking in relative terms. And relative can mean two things here. First, connecting input-output, so thinking in unit cost terms and setting constraints in that. Uh, shouldn't cost more than five euro per unit to produce. Um, um, you can spend more if you produce more. But we can also think football and say that there's no five euro per unit, but your constraint, but your euro per unit should be competitive. So if you're at six, that's okay if competition is at seven, eight, but not if they are at three or four. If you have internal profit centers with tough bottom line targets, also a way of managing cost. And last but not least, the alternative of nothing at all. No budget, no target, no nothing. The only numbers in this alternative is actual cost actually cost coming from the accounting system. Here we look at trends. If it looks okay, we do nothing. If it looks a bit strange, then um, we investigate. And there might be perfectly good reasons for why looking at this. But, and this is important, we might also come across managers, teams, who consciously or unconsciously abuse the trust that lies in this model. And the only thing we know if we show trust in an organization is that it will be abused. In Equinor, it has happened, it will happen again. That is not the issue. The issue is how do we respond? Because the simple but wrong response is the clothing hanger response, to punish everybody because somebody did something wrong. Right? For a CEO to say that this trusting doesn't work, look what happened here and happened here. Everybody back to the good old budgeting. Very simple but very wrong. The right response is to take that very firm talk with those involved and let it have the necessary consequences. This is not about being soft and evasive. It's about, again, not putting everybody in jail because somebody did something wrong. The further to the right we are, the stronger we have to be on values, um, direction. 
And then there are two additional guardrails that many companies have in place already. One is what is often called decision authorities. So how big a decision in monetary terms can a manager make before you have to go one level up? And this must, of course, be generous enough. The second one is what we call spending guidelines. Again, Equinor has no travel budgets, but there is a principle that if you fly in Europe, then it's economy class. If you fly continental or outside, then you can fly business. Nothing to do with travel budgets, it just helps people to make decisions. So that is what I wanted to say about more specifically about the cost area and about beyond budgeting. And I hope that you kind of um, got a better understanding of what this is all about. Uh, I hope you saw the link to Agile. I hope you understand that there can be no Agile transformation without beyond budgeting. But also, what you heard was the very short version. Very short version. Um, here is a longer version. This is a book um, I wrote some time ago, which has more about everything. There are more cases. There is more about um, yeah, a lot of stuff, um, including uh, a lot of implementation advice coming from all the companies I've helped. And, um, but this book has a kind of normal size of 200, 250 pages. The problem with those kind of books is that the people that we really, really need to, meet, to reach with these messages are busy people with limited time to read. So my last book, which is just out, um, is a thinner one aimed at executives with limited time to read. That's why there's also an audio book, because some of these people are, are, um, uh, don't have time to read it all, but they do drive in the car from time to time and can listen to audio books. And I'm very, very happy that uh, Gary Hamill, if you know uh, who that person is, is the American professor who is the number one in the world, I would argue, on management innovation, that he wrote the forward. So that's what I wanted to share with you. This is my contact details. And um, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter, that's highly appreciated. And the only thing I write about is this stuff. There are no cats and dogs and grandchildren, I promise. And um, at the bottom, the website to the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, which is an um, international network of individuals and companies interested in this. We actually had our um, last meeting in London uh, yesterday uh, with some great speakers and great cases. And then also my own uh, simple website for uh, my own company, because I left uh, corporate life two years ago to be able to work uh, full time with this, so um, if anybody kind of wants, uh, wants me in to do inspirational talks or whatever and discuss with your finance organization and executive team, then, well, this is how you can reach me. So, with that, I understand that there should be some questions and then I need to get on my glasses again. The reason I took off my glasses, I can't hardly see you because I'm in, I almost feel like a rock star, you know, with these rock concerts and I can't see the audience because the lights are quite strong, but now I put them on, so. so um, we usually, in our teams, do you may have any way out to be? Uh, on the first one, you need to help your executives to understand the serious problems with traditional management. Because, I mean, these are not stupid and evil people, typically, but they are simply not aware. They are so far away, especially in big companies, from the reality of what happens out there. They don't know how dysfunctional this process is. From that executive boardroom, this might look very kind of logical and orderly. So help them understand the problems. And um, then to help them a bit more, show them this list of companies that, that have gone beyond budgeting. There might be competitors on that list, right? That might kind of make them a bit uh, uh, interested. And then show them this separation slide as a very simple, practical, logical, tested way of getting started. That will not scare them. But once you've separated, you have started. Uh, Joff, yeah. That is a great question. Why hasn't more companies, bank, other banks, uh, copied um, uh, Handelsbanken? Actually, when I wrote my first book, I had a chapter about the bank. Um, and I sent that chapter to Mr. Valander uh, when he was still alive and asked, do you have any comments? Did I understand this correctly? And I got a handwritten letter back. And he said, yes, this is great, you have understood it, but I have one comment. Because I've been speculating in that chapter about, again, how come more banks, other banks haven't copied? Um, and I have been saying it could be that this is so big and Handelsbanken is so far ahead and so on. And he said, all of that is right, but you have forgotten one thing. 
It's about power. Power. These executives are afraid of losing power. What they haven't understood is that I got more power by letting go of power, if power means making great things happen in an organization. Today, there are some more, more banks that have copied, but uh, still, uh, it is a good question. This is an example of flexible short-term budgeting. Well, uh, first of all, I mean, we are trying to kind of park the word budgeting. We are trying to separate it into these three different things, target setting, forecasting, resource allocation. And yes, it is more flexible and could be more short-term. We are saying, do it on a reason that suits what you are the business you're in and what you're doing, right? Let that be the reason that drives this instead of that very often irrelevant um, calendar uh, year. So, um, so yes, I, so if you park the word budgeting, it is a more flexible and uh, more short term, if that makes sense. Could also in some cases be also be longer term, that your reason is longer than the calendar year. <laughs> and, uh, Analogy between Beyond Agile and a rock band. Hey, well, um, you know, some of the best, uh, some of the best rock bands. They were rebels. They challenged the existing, right? So, so many waves of kind of new music challenging the existing. And in a way, that is what we are trying to do in Beyond Budgeting, uh, challenging the existing. Um, not as a goal in itself, but because we think we need something better. And talking about challenging, um, some of you might be familiar with corporate rebels. Two uh, Dutch guys who uh, got so fed up of uh, corporate bureaucracy that they quit and started to travel the world to find out what was happening out there on management innovation and then formed corporate rebels and it has a great big organization today. Uh, they, don't develop, they don't do management innovation themselves, but they are great at, at um, discovering other companies. And again, I love that name, corporate rebels. So if we should have renamed Beyond Budgeting today, that might have been the name, corporate rebels, because I think that's basically what we are. Ah, uh, oh, that's a wine address. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, are there other questions or are we done? I think I've been through all. Any additional ones or? Okay, I'm gonna be around, I try to kind of be in that agile uh, coaching, the co coaching corner up there. Um, and I also try to be around well, for drinks. Well, no, I have to because I'm gonna buy some of you, hopefully a free drink. If you can guess how many vinyl records I have. Uh, I can give you a hint, it's too many. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. It's been amazing. I think there were a few more uh, questions remaining. Uh -huh, okay, Very interesting, but let's, let's do them also during the break. Now we are going to have a 30-minute oh, coffee okay, no, break. So, oh, sorry. Some of them very useful and very uh, relevant to apply in the, in the regular work. So uh, everybody here, especially the people who did ask the questions, uh, please make sure to, to come to the speaker and to, and to ask them. Uh, we are now having a 30-minute break. Coffee, no booze, but yeah, coffee and a little bit of sunshine. I think, I think we still have it outside a little bit of chat, and a big bit of the coaching corner, please. Plus, do visit the sponsors. I think they still have some goodies and giveaways. And we need to hear from you. I think we do have one correct answer to the vinyl records really? in your possession. Yes, but you need to state out the number so we confirm. The number is uh, three and a half thousand. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Well, we got from one of the support uh, technicians. Excellent. One of the technicians was actually kind enough to write the name of the, of the vinyl store in Belgrade. We get, we get two or three more uh, recommendations here in the, in the Q&A for your session. So I think you're going to increase your 3,500 vinyl record compilation, right? Collection. And congratulations to Marian Dragic. Like, this is the second time that this person has got their free drinks for tonight. Congratulations. Marian, you need to put your photograph here so we can find you. I, I need to talk to you about lotto numbers. 
Have a great coffee and see you in 30 minutes sharp.